All right, welcome to the June 19th, 2023 and on specification working group meeting. A um, few things to talk about. Unfortunately, a new Zoom link that's causing lots of fun today that not people are unable to find the room, unfortunately, have the wrong link, so that's not good. Um, report on the Anoncred 010 release, um, a little bit on the workshop we had, uh, mentorship program, we're delighted to have started and making um, great progress already. Um, I don't have the to-do list, so I think I'm going to knock that off the list um, as much as in a form that I'd like to have it in, so I think I'll knock that off the, off the list. Um, I just put the chat link into the agenda in case anyone wants to update. I'm going to edit, um, turn on editing so I can update as we go. So we're not going to get to that this week. Um, uh, the big thing I wanted to talk about was uh, a couple of things on revocation approaches and, and go over um, possibilities there. There's a few things happening that I wanted to share. Um, we are recording this. A reminder, this is a Linux Foundation Hyperledger Foundation meeting. So Linux Foundation antitrust policy is in effect and as well the code of conduct. Um, for welcome, um, Aritra is here. Um, I think he was here last time as well, but really like to welcome him. He is the um, Hyperledger mentor um, for the men from the mentorship program. And um, so he's joining us as beginning work on the non credit specification impl implementation. So basically the um, coming up with and completing the work on um, the cryptography in um and on creds and aligning it with the implementation and he already has done some great work this week it was um good to see him following working with mike lauder Richard and mike lauder working together really nicely on on coming up with how the tails file is generated in the revocation process so very cool we'll see a pull request relatively soon so um definitely a huge welcome Aritra. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Um, uh, from as as I mentioned on, on in the Anoncred's announcements, the zero one zero Rust implementation was officially released, so we have that. Um, it is still using the Ursa crate, but we'll soon transition that uh, over to use the CL signatures crate, um, the non-cred CL signatures crate, so that's good. Um, and it's starting to be used, I believe it is in the 040 um, Aero uh, frameworks, um, Aries frameworks JavaScript um, code, so that's good to see. Um, then good to have that out there. Um, that allows us to keep moving forward with um, making that the official or, or the used release. Um, there is work going on in um, Akapai to get it used there. It's not complete yet, um, but we are working on it. So um, hopefully that will be available very soon. And we can transition away from the, um, the older uh, implementations of an on credits into this new one. Um, <clears throat> and on creds v2 working group, um, last week we talked about how the model um, supports the multiple underlying cryptographic signatures. So in, in on creds 2.0, um, there are currently four signatures that um, Mike Lauder has worked with and, and has, um, has demonstrated. Um, CL signatures, BLS signatures, um, BBS plus signatures, and PS signatures. The latter two are the most likely to be, um, you know, the first, the most commonly used. And so um, those are, uh, Mike sort of showed how the different models are supported and basically how we get all the features or almost all the features depending on the signatures used from a zero knowledge proof, um, uh, the cryptographic primitives 
um, to be able to use the to use the different signatures. Um, next week we'll be talking about presentation data models. So with that, um, anything, anyone have any other topics they want to raise for this meeting in particular? Okay. Um, jump down to the Anoncreds workshop report. Um, I'll just briefly cover that. We did have an Anoncreds workshop a couple of weeks ago, really well attended. Um, very happy with it. This is the first meeting since then of, of that. So just to, to recap, we had um, around 400 people express interest, um, close to 200 um, show up, um, you know, for the initial part of it and um, over the entire um, workshop wound up with about 70 left at the end three and a half hours in which is excellent um, so lots of interest there um, we did use um, uh, a tool for doing the, the, the lab labs in the course that worked out really well I'm trying to get an instance of that deployed so that anyone can continue to use that. It's, I believe it's still available right now, um, but won't be available too long. Um, and so I'm trying to get a permanent um, instance of that running um, so that it can be used and people can experiment with the non-creds and, and with other things and verify the credentials community. They can basically really easily create their own um, uh, experiment with their own schemas and, and generate them. So. That's kind of cool. Um, two things that I mentioned that are on the list to do are um, is a to do list. I, I actually have a to do list written in in pretty rough form, but more or less it's it's handwritten on on my iPad, so not really in a form um, for sharing. And then um, one of the things that Aritra, Mike, and I are working on is sort of coming up with a way to in the specification, how to balance out, you know, making the spec understandable of how the, the process works and putting in the precision of the uh, cryptographic details for each step. And so we're gonna take a look at a couple of examples, um, how BBS Plus um, has submitted to I, IETF. And um, Mike also has access to how the um, PS signatures um, are, submitting theirs to IETF and we'll take a look at those for um, how uh, how to um, best balance those two um, sort of competing um, goals, making the spec understandable and useful and uh, to to everyone and providing the detailed cryptography necessary to implement it. Um, with that, I wanted to talk about revocation today so let me um, take a moment to move this so I can get access to my command line <laughs> I guess I could do it this way um, revocation option so it's all good um, I wanted to take a look at sort of where we are with um, revocation options and and share that. So jump in anytime if anyone has questions. I can see hands raised or chat. So um, feel free to um, let me know if I'm if people are interested uh, in, in jumping in. Um, so we need to replace the insufficiently scalable in our credits v1 as soon as possible. Um, revocation is a requirement of almost all use cases, and that's true whether they realize it or not. I mean, there's a lot that aren't using it right off, but almost certainly they 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 would use it if they could. We definitely want to use expiry dates in verifiable credentials. Um, those are crucial, but not sufficient. Um, so we want we must be able to support revocation as well, and and every credential scheme needs to be able to. Um, I'm going to talk about the options in terms of the participants, the attributes and trade-offs, um, and then the options themselves. What are the, the, I think we're up to five different ways of doing it right now. Um, the participants, obviously, issuers, holders, and verifiers. We know about those. Issuers issue and revoke 
unilaterally revoke. They want to be able to, you know, whether they notify the holder or not, they want to be able to revoke the credential. Um, the holder wants to be able to prove um, that they are, they have a credential that has not been revoked. Um, and then the verifiers want to verify that when they get a credential from a holder that it has not been been revoked. Um, what we found recently is um, uh, based on the various choices uh, or options available for revocation, we've got sort of three three sources of, of data. Um, the verifiable data registry is one, and that's what obviously is, is commonly used. Um, ledgers, that's what Indy uses um, for an on which is the source of the revocation data, whether it's the source of data for the holder or for the verifier or for both, is the ledger itself. That's, that's one way to do it. Um, Several schemes have come out now with what are called revocation managers. The revocation manager might be simply the issuer, but also might be someone um, somewhat independent of the issuers. They have to work with the issuer, um, but they can be independent of the issuer. So the revocation manager is a term we will start to see now in some of these schemes. Um, Basically, they interact with the issuer to get revocation information, and then they respond to requests from holders and or verifiers for revocation status information. So um, they, the idea here is, is that although the scheme is a call back to the issuer by the holder to get some information necessary to prove that their credential has not been revoked, it would be nice if they were separated from the issuer. So you were calling home to the issuer. So um, revocation manager is a way to do that. Um, as noted, the revocation manager could indeed be the issuer and they respond to requests from the holders for, for that information. Um, but but they, you know, in addition to being the issuer, they could be independent and simply the issuer publishes information to them and the revocation manager respond, uses that information to respond to holders. And then the last is sort of a combination of the two as well is, is a file server, which is a revocation manager or even a, a, a VDR, a, a, a verifiable data registry, where um, the revocation manager is passive. In other words, the file server provides static files, not a server-generated response. So a revocation manager is, is you know, kind of by definition, an active component. Um, it gets a request, it does some sort of calculation and it returns the result. A file server in, in the way I'm using it here is, is a revocation manager where all it does is pass back a file. Um, so it, it, it somehow has a static file, usually received from the issuer and it passes it back. Um, a verifiable data registry, Interestingly, um, a, a verifiable data registry could absolutely be that passive file server. In um, Indy, it's kind of interesting in that it's a combination of those two because Indy actually, the, the ledger does a calculation and passes back a result. So in Indy, um, the status, the static data um, that is passed from the issuer and put onto the Indy ledger is deltas of what credentials have been revoked or unrevoked. So those get collected by the VDR by Indy. And then on request, um, Indy sends back a, a, uh, a calculation that is all of the deltas collected um, from the time the holder has requested it to the current time, or, or at least for a time range. And so this is somewhat different. This is not, this is different than a, a generic file server. On the other hand, um, in the BDR approach used by Checks, for example, um, they actually, in that implementation, it, the BDR, the, the Check ledger is, is operating as a file server. It is getting the full state of all of the credentials within it and it's passing back a result 
So the holder that is simply the state that was given by the issuer. So it's it's much more um, passive. It doesn't have to do a calculation. And that's a, in my mind, that's a better quality, a better um, attribute in that the, the ledger in this case doesn't have to know anything special about revocation or, or do any special operation. It just treats the data as this is what the issuer put onto the ledger and here's what I'm giving back to you from the ledger. So hopefully those participants make sense. The, the three kind of blur together, but, but there's definitely distinct differences between them. Okay. So here are sort of the characteristics, the attributes of the schemes and the trade-offs amongst them. So a hard requirement for all of them, just it doesn't make the list unless it is one that no linkable identifier is given to the verifier. Um, that is somewhat um, undercut or can be undercut if the scale is such that the identifier is not large enough. So this third one, if the re replication registry size is not large enough to hide in the crowd, then a linkable identifier can be derived from multiple um, credentials that are in different registries. So um, although, for example, the, the um, current and non-creds does not provide a linkable identifier, it doesn't sort of pass muster because the size uh, of the revocation registers is, is small enough that given say two credentials, the likelihood of uh, two, two credentials that have a large population, chances are that will produce a, a linkable identifier, that combination of registry, um, revocation registry identifiers will be, uh, will be um, unique enough that you, you pretty well get a linkable identifier. So hard requirement there, register, revocation registry size must be large enough. There will be a revocation registry ID to find the information. And usually a revocation ID is the revocation registry ID plus the index within that revocation registry. So that, that is the information um, that revocation ID, whether it's named or not in a particular scheme, uh, essentially exists. And that is how a, the, the holder's specific credential is identified so that you can tell whether it's been revoked or not. And ideally, that is shared between the issuer and the holder only. So um, the uh, that's basically just a characteristic that there's a revocation register ID. That's usually very blatant and, and specific. It's reverage ID it exists somewhere, but there is also um, the index of the credential and the combination of the two is the re revocation ID. That is the thing we don't want to share with the verifier. That would be a unique linkable identifier. So that's the thing we're not sharing. Uh, another hard requirement is that there essentially be some mechanism that allow an effectively unlimited number of credentials per credential type. So if the revocation registry size is limited, there must be some way to have multiple registries for a credential type. So um, this is supported in an on-creds, obviously, with, you know, even though that, say, 10,000 is the max you can have for a, for a um a, a, re a revocation registry, each specific one, a, a, a credential type can have many of them. And so you get effectively uh, unlimited, lots of things to manage and stuff like that, but you get effectively an unlimited number of registries, uh, unlimited number of credentials per um, credential type. Um, I talked about call home earlier. Um, call home is a thing that would be really nice to avoid. <laughs> um, so this is the idea that um, the issuer of the credential can track what the, the holder is doing with their credential if they can correlate that the, the, the holder has to do something 
has to interact with the issuer every time they go to use it or um and and worse um if the holder has to call back to the issuer to get a piece of data to create a register uh, a presentation and then immediately the verifier has to go get a piece of information to verify it um that actually could enable the issuer to to um use the metadata basically to track oh this holder um created a presentation and this verifier verified one right in the same period of time so probably that holder is interacting with that verifier and again that's um, collect allowing the issuer to collect more information so basically we want to um, it would be nice if we could avoid calling home during presentation entirely or at least enough that we can avoid uh, can minimize either the actual or perception of tracking um, by the issuer and so this is where that that um, you know avoiding that tracking uh, or the perception of that tracking gets interesting when you talk about a revocation manager that is independent, supposedly independent of the issuer. Um, they, if if they are actually colluding together, the issuer and the revocation managers, and such that they're sharing, for example, web log information, um, that tracking can still happen. And so the more we can get away from that, the better. This is, again, why the ledger is a good place to do that. If the ledger is independent of the issuer, um, then the holder calling the, the, the ledger to get some piece of data and the verify calling the ledger to get pieces of data is, is far more difficult um, to actually get collusion going on such that tracking can be done. Very unlikely that that can happen. So that's where the ledger is you know, kind of the ideal um, revocation manager. Um, so basically column assessments must be considered, must consider the likelihood of collusion. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, this, this page goes to the amount of effort that the uh, parties must go through. So we can assume an issuer is an enterprise app um, or has sufficient power to track all uh, all issuances. That's just a given. If an issuer wants to revoke a credential after it issues it, it must track all the issu issuances, the revocation ID, and whoever uh, the holder is that that credential was issued to so that it knows if later something happens that it needs to revoke it, um, it has all the information necessary to do it. It can unilaterally relax. Uh, revoke credentials, I mean, with or without letting the holder know they've been, um, they've been, um, uh, you unilaterally revoke credentials, um, with or without contacting them. And finally, they have to be able to publish revocation as necessary immediately or in batches. So, um, whatever, uh, the, there can be a decent amount of um, processing necessary. It can't be obviously um, a, uh, a ridiculous amount of, of processing for uh, an issuer to publish a revocation, but it can be you know, a relatively costly um, calculation and that's okay. It is not, uh, we assume that an issuer basically is not a mobile app and therefore it's limited by its, uh, or has has severe limits on its processing or um, uh, processing or, or, or data, uh, the size of the data files it's dealing with, but it's an enterprise app and can handle things like that. I apologize, I missed the question earlier. What do we mean by perception of tracking versus tracking proper? Um, just to get back to that a little bit, um, from a, this is per, uh, a particularly sensitive issue for um, governments, and that is that um, certainly in in a number of places, and this has been very true in Canada at least, and I think in Europe as well, um, there's a great desire that 
um, the government not only not track, but also not be perceived as tracking the issuers. And, and one of the things that can happen is that basically initiatives set up to provide this type of uh, digital trust and digital identity um, has been blocked or eliminated, not, not necessarily because um, the technology was bad, but the perception was bad. And um, so one of the things that, that governments are particularly sensitive to, and that's why uh, you know we raise this and talk about this as, as one of the concerns when I put my VC Gov hat on, is, um, is making sure that there's not a, uh, that, that we're able to provide as much evidence as possible that we're not tracking and, and we're you know, going out of our way to put a scheme in place so we're not tracking. And so that's what I mean by perception and tracking. Um, if, you know, for example, the, the government BC Gov domain is gov.bc.ca. If all of the calls from the web um, from the web app to when when you present a transact uh, when you you when you present a credential, there's always a call back to a gov.bc.ca domain. Well, that would be a bad thing, and that would be a perception that oh. The government was just notified that you used your um, web app to do a um, a call uh, a presentation. You were sharing your, you know, you were proving your age, um, and in doing that, you called back to uh, gov.bc.ca to do that. That's not what we want. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, we assume the holder is a wallet, uh, a wallet web app. It doesn't have to be a wallet web app, but it will be a common um, use case. And so that's kind of the lowest common denominator. So should not have to download substantial files during presentation, e.g. Um, shouldn't be more than a megabyte of information as at the outside of how big a file should be. And presentation generation time should be relatively short in along the side along the expectation of of a of um, a, a web app. So say one to three seconds, including data collection. So from the point you say, oh, I want to, um, you know, generate a proof. I scan, uh, I scan it, and I get a prompt back saying, do you want to send this? That presentation generation time should be pretty short in the into the one to three seconds including data co collection and, and other activities going on, the user interface and so on. Um, surprisingly, um, assume the verifier is also a mobile app. Again, this is less likely, um, but will be a common use case, we think, in us, particularly in, in um, you know, I, uh, personal identification, that, that a point of sale terminal, that a, um, a kiosk, an iPad kiosk that actually um, a, uh, a user scanning it uh, will be a verifier app. And so while this is not nearly as likely as the holder, um, similar um, attributes should be taken into place so that the verifier can be a mobile app. So again, should not have to download substantial files, verifier time should be short, basically the same uh, criteria as the holder. So that's not as common, um, commonly seen, but we're seeing that a, a lot more often. Why is it not a requirement to notify the holder and then the holder can ignore the notification? Doesn't the holder get notified when a credential is issued? So a, a holder definitely gets notified when a credential gets issued, but they don't necessarily get notified when a cred credential is revoked. And so that's what I'm talking about. Does that make sense? Um, so Aries has a, so if an issuer retains a connection or relationship, a DIDCOM connection with a holder, um, there is a protocol that allows the issuer to notify the holder that their credential has been revoked. But if no such thing, um, but if no such thing exists, then it's um, then they do not have to notify, and the wallet, the holder, would not know, not necessarily know that their credential has been revoked. Um, so, if they're using something like OpenID for 
for VCs. There is no mechanism to allow a issuer to reach out to a holder and say, hey, your credential has been revoked. So um, that would have to be a separate topic. Does that, does that answer the question? So it makes it tricky for the holder because um, they have to, they can, they may be able to monitor something like a ledger to see when their credential gets revoked. Um, they can certainly determine at the time they generate a generate a presentation. Oh crap, my my credential has been revoked. I didn't realize that. So they would know it before they share it, but they may not notice until the time they go to construct the presentation that their credential has been revoked. Okay. So um, attributes, characteristics, and trade off. One more is preferences. Um, holders and verifiers collect. Oops. Um, what have I done? There we go. Holders and verifiers collect data from different sources. So that's a preference. Um, this is that comes back to that perception of um, um, tracking. And while it would be bad to track that a holder is generating a presentation, it would be even worse if the tracking was the holder was, uh, you know, was presenting a verification and the verifier and, and there, there was tracking of who the verifier was at the same time. That would be particularly bad. So the, uh, and so these are not hard and fast rules, but the preference would be the holders and verifiers collect data from different sources. Um, again, nice to have the holders and verifiers collect their data from other than the issuer. Um, and then this is that one revocation data sources should be perceptively independent of the issuer. So again, that same topic that we that we went back to. And, and finally, a static source is preferred over an active source. So it would be really nice if the source of data was a simple file server with static content versus requiring a dynamic service, which has to do some sort of calculations, uh, uh, some sort of calculation in order to do it. It would be nice if the holder could simply collect a, a, a static file uh, and be able to do some sort of calculation on it to do, uh, on its own um, versus calling a service, which has to provide a real-time um, calculation and so on. So again, not hard and fast, those are, are flexible and sometimes um, schemes might be better because for, for different combinations of reasons, um, but that's one. And then finally, this is a new one that I threw in there just because I noticed it, but nice to have alignment with status list 2021's bit array technique. So um, for those, I think most of us on the call here are aware of status, status list 2021 uses a bit array. Now it, it is. It provides linkable information. So, just quick summary: um, issuer has a revocation registry and a and an index a that is uh, an index into the registry that is a and the registry itself is a bit per credential. And basically, if the the bit is on or off depending on whether a credential has been revoked or not. Um, when in using status list 2021, the issuer publishes um, the location or, or the data, um, the, the bit array periodically, whenever they want to revoke credentials. The on issuance, they give the index, the, the RevReg ID plus the index to the holder. On presentation, the holder gives that, that um, RevReg ID plus index to the verifier, and it's the verifier that goes looks up in the bit array. Um, one of the things that would be nice to have would be alignment with that. And the reason it's nice to have is um, one of the things we're seeing lately is that um, a, a verifiable credential might be issued with multiple um, signatures on it. So a non-creds plus a NIST signature. And what that allows is that on presentation, the verifier can say, I must have a NIST signature, therefore you must give me, you know, proof that there's a, a, a NIST base, you know, a signature from the NIST, um, 
you know, allowable cryptography. Now, when you do that, when you have, if you have that combination of a NIST plus an anon creds, you lose, if you use the NIST one, you lose all of the anon creds um, privacy and, and that just goes out the window, but at least you can present your credential. If you, if the verifier does support um, the privacy preserving um, capability inherent in an on-creds, then you can present in an on-creds credential. What would be really nice to have is not to have two different registries for revocation, but rather just a common one. So alignment with status list 2021's bit array technique would allow you to do that. But of course, the mechanism must be uh, have those attributes, those must-haves like unlinkability. So that is a requirement still. But I throw that in there because one of the techniques is actually aligned with status list 2021. So it would be a really nice to have if we could actually use the same um, revocation publication method with both NIST and non creds credentials. So with all that said, wow, that took a while. Um, we've got four, four um, revocation methods that are known. Um, a non-creds V1 that we've talked about, which is CKS signatures with a tailless file. Allosaur, which is revocation managers contacted at presentation time. Um, linked validity verifiable credentials. This was a technique proposed um, by um, Andreas Freitag at this and um, uh, paper. published about that so he published it last you know we talked about it last week or the week before or
Can you hear me? Any luck? Huh. Sorry about no, that. All know. right. Well, I guess I'll try finishing. Obviously, I was on the last slide. <laughs> Ah, uh, well, all right, so that's the uh, the final slide. I don't know where I, when I cut out, but I won't repeat too much. And on creds um, gets its red because of this. Um, we have call home on these two as yellows, not eliminating them. We have nice size of attributes because all you're doing is doing a call and getting basically a um, the, the data backs. It's the um, revocation managers that are holding on to data and um, they're providing um, data back. So relatively small um, holder size requirements. Um, ZK SAM has a larger um, requirement, but you're not calling home, you're calling back to some static array. And it's and it is a bit array so that um, it does align with um, the status list 2020. So um, that wraps up what I wanted to, to share out. We're really looking at trying to nail down and moving forward with these. Um, I, I think the LVVM is quite an interesting option that was new. It's very similar to Allosaur, but in my opinion, much less complex. It's much more aligned with um, exactly what, um, uh, you know, simpler way to do it. Um, with LVVM, basically, you call to a, um, a revocation manager and basically request a new credential be issued that that um, your credential is not revoked. And it's therefore, and has an expiry associated, or at least, sorry, a, a time of issuance associated with it. And so a, a verifier, when they request um, a credential that's revocable, they expect to get back the uh, uh, a a not revoked credential as well. So it's it's very explicit. It's just using two and on creds, um, two verifiable credentials, the actual credential plus the not not revoked credential. And so it's very similar um, with the non creds. It uses the it was issued to the same blinded link secret to show that they're bound together. The binding between the a revoked credential and the um, and the originally uh, the non-revoked credential and the issued credential in, initially. So those are the techniques. ZK SAM, I think I've talked about for at least some of you before, but this is one that is um, the least rigorously reviewed, but has some super interesting. Um, um, characteristics to it. I think it's got the best characteristics um, in that you get a million credentials and a revocation size, and yet worst case, you've got a 153K file that gets put onto a file server or gets published somewhere that can be downloaded and and read and and processed by the holder. So the the attributes of it are are very nice, but it is the least rigorously reviewed. In fact, has barely re been reviewed at all. So, so that's one we're interested in getting reviewed. Um, so that wraps up what I was going to share. Yes, um, reference material on LVVM. Yes, um, I will send it out to the uh, mailing list, and I'll send it to you directly as well, just to make sure you get it. Um, and yeah, and, and um, make sure you have that. Um, as I say, it was just published the other day. I can send out um, links to all of these. Um, but yeah, I will do that. Um, that wraps up what I had planned for today. Is there any other any other things to talk about, or shall we call it a day? Um, next time we talk, um, we will have, whoops, where did I go? There you are. Uh, I lost the screen. Oh, yes, go ahead. Hand up. Just listening. Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, I asked a question in chat. Is okay. the revocation the unlimited, basically?
So in all of these schemes, you never sh share a the uh, you never share that with the verifier. So the ability for the verifier to re-verify should not, it also should be, actually, you're right, I should put that in explicitly as a hard requirement that it's not um, a thing we want, we don't want to allow. Um, that would be a, a, a privacy negative. You are absolutely correct. So in the status list 2021, which we don't consider, uh, uh, you know, a, a privacy preserving it it would not meet the requirement it because it shares an uh, it shares a linkable identifier and in in sharing that it allows for the ongoing monitoring by the verifier to see if that credential ever gets revoked and so yes um that would be a definite privacy negative All right. Thanks all. Hope that was helpful. Um, I'm meeting with the L of CL signatures tomorrow, and we'll be sharing some of this as well as we talk. Um, Anna is interested in, um, in um, understanding the state of where we are and um, maybe willing to um, help out in some way or, or, or try to coordinate things. So um, that's a possibility. So Hart Montgomery and I are meeting with Anna tomorrow and looking forward to that. All right. Have a great day, everyone, or the rest of your day. See you again in a couple of weeks. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.